Awakening by Solo Citizen Chapter 3 Running in Circles Present Day A thud, thud, thud came pounding on Lumina's door early the next morning and put an end to her rest. Riding on a wave of hot adrenaline, she shot up in her bed with her eyes trained on her door and her ears forward and alert as a bunny rabbit's. She stared at the door without moving or breathing while she studied the thuds from the other side. After a moment, she crept out of bed, picked up a lamp in her mouth, and approached the door. She tapped the lock controls and raised her head to strike with the lamp, but she dropped it in shock once the doors were open. A set of robotic arms were deployed from the ceiling and busy hosing down a busted emergency ladder, and every 60 seconds they took a break from watering the twisted metal to polish it with a scrubbing attachment. The scrubbing arm beat the ladder into the floor with a thud, thud, thud. By Celestia's beard, what is going on in here? Please restate your command. Animus's voice boomed out of a speaker by the mechanical arms and continued to spray water on the ladder and drenched everything in the hallway. That wasn't a, that wasn't a command. Lumina tried her best to shield herself from the water, but still managed to get soaked. Please state a valid command. Uh-oh, I think I get it. Lamina hit her face in her front hoof. Last night, just before she retired for the evening, she spent the better part of an hour trying to get Animus to fix the staircase leading to the bridge and restating her command. The conversation ended with her trotting off and telling Animus to just clean up the stairway. And this was how he interpreted her. I asked you to clean the stairway, the one going to the bridge, not wash and scrub this ladder, Lumina said. This? What you're doing right now is making a mess, which is the exact opposite of what I asked you to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not my fault. What? Lumina dropped her jaw just a bit, but then recomposed herself. How is this not your fault? The mechanical arms retracted up to a hub in the ceiling and repositioned themselves next to Lumina. Analyzing previous valid command. Just clean up the stairway, Animus said. Key words recognized stairway and clean. Command executed nine hours and 42 minutes ago. 1,003 targets designated for cleaning procedure. Wait, you mean to tell me you've been doing this all night? All over the ship? The thought horrified Lamina. Please restate your command. Lumina darted to the hyperlift and rode it up to the forwardmost section of the ship. The stairway was still just as broken as she had left it the other night, and now there was a large puddle covering the floor. She maintained hope that the observation deck escaped the deluge. When she ventured down for a quick peek, the observation deck was already knee-deep in water. Furniture bobbed up and down, and little waves sloshed against the walls and panoramic windows. Lumina decided not to deal with it. She took the hyperlift to what remained of the kitchen and ordered a daffodil and lavender sandwich from the food synthesizer. The light from above her never stopped flickering, and the sandwich tasted, well, acrid. The urge to gag rolled up her throat and fought her through the entire meal. After breakfast, she ordered a full sweep of the long and short-range sensors and headed down to Cargo Bay F6 to check on her food supplies while the ship ran the scans. Lumina climbed all the way down to the starboard storage area and stumbled her way through the poorly lit passageways, only to reach Cargo Bay F-6's hatch and find nothing but the frozen waste staring at her from beyond the window. Lumina's ears flopped down and she dashed to the other food reserves. The Luna Dream had two others, Cargo Bay's E-6 and D-6, and each held enough organic protein goo to fuel the synthesizers for a year. When she reached Cargo Bay E-6, her heart sank and her knees quivered till they threatened to give out from under her. The refrigeration unit was busted, and the goose sack strung up along the Cargo Bay ceiling already started to turn pink with mold. The food synthesizers could reconstitute most mold and contaminants into healthy food, but not the pink stuff. The pink stuff killed desperate pilots who tried to eat it. Gulping down her fear, Lumina hurried to the last Cargo Bay. Luckily for her, Cargo Bay D-6 and its contents were still intact. Thanks, Celestia. She slumped against the hatch and caught her breath. On her way back to the kitchen, she ran the math on her food supplies. 
Prior to the crash, the food synthesizers were mainly drawing goo from Cargo Bay F6, so with F6 and E6 gone, she still had a full year worth of food. In an emergency, the synthesizers could reconstitute sewage into food, which she heard was good for the amount of food she had, plus the waste tank's current levels divided by half. So, that left her with just over a year and three seasons before starving. Rounded up every step of the way, of course. Lumina moped into the kitchen, plopped down into the nearest chair, and buried her face in her hooves. She needed to distract herself, desperately, so she picked up a data pad and checked the sensor sweep. Long-range scans identified this star system and pinpointed the Luna Dream's location to an unexplored system 200 light-years off course. If Lumina fired the distress beacon now, some pony might pick it up in the next couple millennia, and if they were feeling generous, dispatch a search team soon after. That was, of course, assuming that whoever attacked her didn't hear her signal first and come looking for her. Lumina gulped and cleared the command from her touchscreens and navigated to the short-range sensor report. Calling the outside conditions weather was a generous use of the word. There was an atmosphere, yes, but a thin one nearly devoid of oxygen and polluted with ammonia. Temperatures outside reached 180 degrees Kelvin. Atmospheric pressure, negligible. Wind speed, also virtually non-existent. A pony would last all of a few seconds outside without a spacesuit. Lumina ran her hoof across the screen and selected a thermal reading of the nearby terrain. At first, she thought it was a glitch. That big red glob just east of the ship wasn't real. Nothing natural in that wasteland could rise above the ambient blue. Animus? She called out to the AI without taking her eyes from the touchscreen. Recalibrate the ship's sensors and troubleshoot. Please restate your command, it said. Fine, run self-diagnosis on thermal sensors. No request to reword followed. It must have understood her that time. She closed the sensor report and waited for Animus to complete the diagnosis. All systems within standard operating parameters. No way, Lumina said. Something out there was generating heat. It was burning, it was big, and it wasn't natural. Lumina opened the thermal scan again and tagged the location in Luna Dream's navigational database. Lumina galloped across the ship until she found a window facing east. She propped herself up on the railing and gazed out the window with a pair of binoculars. Rocks, glaciers, and more rocks stretched out as far as she could see. Whatever it was, it was buried beneath the literal mountains of ice. Lumina snorted. She had no intention of letting anything stand between her and that heat source. It could be a way off the planet, or she might find a way to restore Animus. Even if all she found was rations, that would still add weeks or months to her lifespan. The Luna Dream was a commercial freighter, and therefore unarmed. However, large rocks drifting in space had a tendency to sneak up on large spaceships. So, Interstellar Express installed powerful mining lasers on their larger ships. The laser was far too inaccurate for the long-range artillery duels of space combat, but it excelled at burning anything at close range. Lumina spent the next hour programming the mining laser and left it to run its firing sequence while she put together the right gear for her expedition. It took Lumina two more hours figuring out how to set the transmat beam to teleport her outside and how to keep it fixed on her so it could bring her back on demand. Normally, Animus would do that for her, but he wasn't up for the challenge. She experimented with some apples before trying it herself. The first five turned into applesauce on the return trip, but after 17 trials without any incidents, she decided it was safe. Standing on the transmat platform with her saddlebags packed and sealed snug in her spacesuit, Lamina tapped a button on her foreleg and blinked. Yellow light surged through her eyelids and flooded her with an overwhelming burning sensation. Transmat beams hurt, but in less time than it took for her to blink, it was over and when Lumina's eyes popped open, she was standing in the frozen wasteland. Pale rings glistened in the sky and arced over the cruel mountains to the west. Ice crystals rained down on Lumina from a big cloud hanging over her destination. Just as the damage reports had said, the bottom decks of the Luna Dream were completely torn away and lay scattered across the ice. Bits and pieces cluttered the snow, and what of that super-clean hull she had been working on? Ruined. Lumina brushed the ice crystals off her visor and pressed onward across the wasteland. Ice squeaked and crunched under her hooves each step of the way. 
The hike towards the heat source took her over a uniform expanse of ice. The valley walls and the wreckage of the Luna Dream helped guide her, however she was not without a GPS system. A little waypoint projected on her helmet marked the path to the drill site. That cloud of water vapor hanging over the site was a dead giveaway, if all else failed. Along the way, she encountered rocks the size of small houses jutting up from the ice like bones protruding from a wound, and ice twisted into spikes at least two meters tall. Less than a kilometer away, she told herself. Her hefty saddlebags weighed down her steps and dug into her back. It was unrelenting, constant, and more than she thought she could endure. In the effort to keep her mind off the pain in her back, Lumina accessed the ship's network and downloaded a news recording from the cargo's database. She caught up with the latest news out of Unitopia while she hiked. Sightings of a Pegasus FTL scout ship has the High Council in a panic today and has left Unicorn and Earth Pony Council members unable to devise a plan of action. The image of a unicorn with a luxurious mane filled the lowermost portion of Lumina's screen. The FTL ship jumped away before the local fleet could intercept. With most of the Unitopian fleets engaged in a battle for the homeworld, the Ministry of Defense has asked the Council to request military support from New Canterlot in the event of a full-scale invasion. Recent polls suggest that the local public believes support from New Canterlot will not be enough to repel an invasion by the Pegasus tribe. Word of the FTL ship has many fleeing the planet and many more demanding a recall of forces on the Equus front. I'm Amethyst Letter, and this has been The Unbiased Truth. Next on UNN, can algae be the secret to a perfect mane? Lumina gestured with her head and the window vanished. No news was good news. She was just about at the heat source anyway. The hole before her stretched down and down and down. Lumina stood at the edge of the precipice and gulped. The beam cut through the ice at an angle, blocking the sun and obscuring the bottom. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? Lumina asked, but to whom she didn't know. She shrugged off her saddlebags, pulled out a stake gun, and while standing on her hind legs, looped one free hoof into the trigger loop and the other around the stock. Lumina nearly tumbled over in that precarious position, but kept her footing long enough to fire a stake into the ice. After testing the stake's hold, Lumina fastened a steel cable to it and dropped the rest down into the hole. She secured the cable to a harness on her suit and took a final look down over the precipice. With that, Lumina descended into the darkness. It was possible that she hadn't drilled far enough to reach the heat source. She entertained the idea, but even as the sunlight faded away, she held out hope that her salvation lay just a few meters deeper. Lumina kicked against the walls of the hole and clung to the cable for dear life. After twenty minutes of descending through the darkness, Lumina aimed her suit-mounted searchlights directly ahead of her. No more than five meters down, a metal plate sat embedded in the ice. Whatever that thing was, it was not of pony origin. The spiraling organic patterns of the thing were a far cry from the utilitarian work of earth ponies and the angular designs of pegasi, and it was much more intricate than even the most regal unicorn architecture. Definitely not unicorn. The organic curves were just too visceral. Lumina unclipped herself from the harness and dropped to the plate. Before Lumina's hooves even touched the metal, the entire thing groaned and opened. She panicked, but before she could hit the button to transmat out, she smacked into metal. Pain blossomed across Lumina's side, but she picked herself up and glanced around her new surroundings. This place was just as alien on the inside as it was on the outside. The long hallway Lumina found herself standing in resembled the intestines of some great animal. Her suit detected an atmosphere, standard pressure, and normal amounts of oxygen, at a comfortable 291 degrees Kelvin. However, she didn't trust it enough to take off her helmet. Save for her suit lights, and a pale glow flickering further down the passage, Lumina was standing in total darkness. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. She gathered up her resolve queued up the transmit beam, and ventured towards the pale blue light. Who am I kidding? This is how ponies end up dead in sci-fi movies. They just keep pushing it, just to see what's around the next corner, and pretty soon an alien is bursting out of some pony's stomach. Lumina stopped talking, paused to gather up her remaining courage, and forced herself to continue. About five minutes later, the passageway opened into a hall that expanded out in every direction. 
Massive columns shot up from the ground and branched out near the top to weave a ceiling together. Blue light trickled down from beyond the canopy. Standing there in awe, Lumina couldn't help but think of both a cathedral and a forest. Her hoof-falls echoed off the pillars and throughout the hall. The hairs on the back of Lumina's head twitched. That primal part of her was trying to warn her. She was being watched. She dismissed the feeling and ventured into the hall. Lumina paused next to one of the pillars near the entrance and discovered carvings of winged creatures and living machines covering its sides. She gasped and ran a hoof over the engraved fingers, recording as much of the pillar as her suit came allowed. The pillar told the story of two tribes. One walked on two legs and flew about on wings as delicate as a butterfly's. Their faces were narrow and full of teeth. The second tribe was a race of machines that came in a multitude of shapes. The figures on the pillar were shown together, living in harmony, with many coexisting under one roof. Lumina galloped over to another pillar, deeper in the hall. That one depicted a great war between the two tribes and the sky full of fire. Lumina walked around the pillar at a slow pace, with her suit camera recording everything, then nearly jumped out of her spacesuit. Before her stood a monster of metal and teeth. It was as long as five ponies and had as many needle-like legs as a centipede. In fact, that's what it looked like, a great black centipede with a blender for a face. It reared up over Lumina as if it were a snake just before a strike. She screamed, and adrenaline burned in her veins to prepare her to run or to hide. Her front legs tried to run, but her rear tried to hide. In the end, she just stood there. Thankfully, it was as motionless as a statue. You! Lumina pointed a hoof at the thing and let out a little laugh. You! You nearly gave me a heart attack, you ugly, stupid statue! She poked it with her hoof and cantered to another column. Maybe that one had something about a way off this planet. Needles tapped against the floor metal right behind her. When she turned around to confront the noise, the centipede was gone. Her heart jumped and the hot fear came surging back. Lumina shook her head and backed away from the spot with ever-widening eyes. Her head darted to her right, left, and over her shoulder and found nothing. She'd seen way too many horror movies to stick around and let that thing sneak up on her. Lumina jabbed a button on her foreleg and let the pain and light of the transmit beam engulf her. The transmat light faded away and the alien scenery was replaced by Luna Dream's familiar interior. Transmit station D-13, by the looks of it. She flung her helmet off and collapsed against the wall, panting. Safe. She was safe. She kicked her gear off and began fighting her way out of her spacesuit. As she pulled free of her suit, she noticed a number of sore spots all over her left side. The slightest touch produced a sharp pain. She hissed. Lumina didn't bother picking up the equipment. She just left it where it fell, but she kept the stake gun on her. It was going under her pillow. After hiking all over the ship and out to that thing, Lumina was exhausted. She wanted more than anything to lie down. Not to sleep, though. Not after what she'd seen. She planned on keeping both eyes open and one hoof on her gun for as long as possible. When Lumina reached her room, the door was already open, and the sound of a power washer blared from inside. Oh, no, she whispered. She forgot to tell Animus to stop cleaning. Lumina crossed the threshold into her room, and after putting her hooves down on a carpet that oozed water, winced. Animus's hub of mechanical arms was deployed over her bed and power washing the walls. That white paint job the Interstellar Express had forbidden Lumina from even touching was nothing more than scattered chips on the floor. Animus, stop! Just stop! Lumina let the steak gun roll out of her mouth and onto the bed. At this point, I'm too tired and bruised to care enough to scold you, so just stop. The power washers trickled to a stop and retracted into the hub over the bed. Command confirmed, said the computer. Cleaning procedure terminated. Lumina hopped onto the water-soaked bedding, sighed, and rolled over to her hiding place to retrieve her book. The box she kept it in was reduced to cardboard slough and when she finally freed it from the mush, it fell into her lap, soaked with water and bleeding ink. No. Her eyes widened. No. She opened the cover. 
The words and pictures all blurred together. No! The pages were so soft that when she tried to turn a page, she ripped out three. No, 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 you stupid machine! Lumina jumped off her bed and delivered a kick to the arms with her hind legs. The machine flinched and played a satisfying alarm. She wanted to kick it more, but then she got a better idea. Lumina picked up the stake gun with her front hooves and fired. Recoil knocked her off her hooves and onto the carpet. She landed on a bruise. Animus's arms were in much worse shape. The stake shot clean through two of its arms before stopping in the hub assembly. A water jet and a scrubbing arm spasmed on her bed. Animus didn't attempt to flee. Neither did it complain, nor did it even attempt to retrieve the severed arms. Instead, it kept the arm hub stationed over her bed without responding. What? You're not going to try to run or hide or fight back? Lumina sat up, ignoring the rogue strands of golden yellow hair jabbing at her eyes, and stomped her hooves. Are you just so weak and helpless that you just accept whatever happens to you? No response came from the damned computer, not even a please restate your command. Lumina sat there on her waterlogged carpet and stared up at the machine. Anger boiled in Lumina, and she barred any thoughts of forgiveness in her mind. The stupid machine should have known better. After a time, cooler thoughts prevailed. She pushed all her anger down into a lump inside her heart, and when she did, shame took its place. At the moment, his engines weren't firing on full power, but he was still her friend. Her only friend, really. She brushed her hair out of her eyes and pushed her mane back behind her ears. Hey, look, I'm really sorry I kicked you, Lumina said. And for shooting off two of your arms, I don't suppose it really matters much to you, but if it's all the same, I'll get those reattached in a little bit. I'm also really sorry for calling you stupid. For the amount of processing power you have right now, you're actually doing a really good job. The mess in the observation deck here and everywhere else around the ship, that was all my fault. You were just trying your best. I really should know better than to lash out like that. It's just that, well, that book over there was all I had left of some pony very important to me. You see, when I was very little, <laughs> I thought I could do magic. Lumina chuckled. I know, it's stupid, but I actually thought I could make things move with my horn. She pointed to the top of her head. I thought I was something magical like a wizard or maybe even an element. My mom was always really supportive, and I think she might have even believed me, but my dad, well, he was a stallion of science and didn't want to hear about it. My parents fought relentlessly over this, and eventually they split up. I don't know all the details of what happened, but I never saw her very much after that. When we left my home, we had to leave her behind. That book, that soggy mess on my bed, that was all I had left of her. After that, Lumina was silent for a long while. She didn't even think Animus had the faintest clue of what she was saying. I've been through a lot these past couple of days, that's all. You'll just have to be patient with me. Lumina laughed again. What am I doing? You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Animus's robot arms rotated in place, almost as if it were turning to face her. You are not alone. All that time, it said nothing. And in all honesty, Lumina didn't expect it to say or even maintain the illusion of listening. But when he finally spoke, he brought the first smile to her face in a long time. Lumina whispered back, Thank you. A few minutes later, Lumina got up and searched a nearby supply cabinet for power tools. She didn't find what she needed to reattach the robotic arms, but she found a set of replacements. Over the course of the evening, Lumina replaced the broken parts. Good as new, she hoped. Lumina abandoned her room for the time being. She gathered up some spare blankets, her stake gun, and a pillow from her closet and took the hyperlift to the AI core. There, she spread out her things on the grated floor and made a bed for herself. I came up to see you. I wanted to say I'm sorry. Lumina touched the remains of his quantum processor with her hoof and leaned in for a hug. I always thought space travel would be easy. Just a bunch of zipping around and flashy lights. No pony said it would be this hard. Over the next hour, Lumina filled Animus in on the details of her trek into the alien ruins. When she finished, she sat down on her blankets, closed her eyes, and searched for that quiet place in her head. She visualized light pouring out through her horn, just like her mother taught her. 
After a few minutes, her horn began to ache. Don't stop now, said a voice in her head. You're so close. Keep going a little more. Why? What's going to happen? Lamina asked. The aching gave way to a deep pressure that flowed down her spine and into her heart, and wherever the light traveled, it brought a pulse. The pulse had a rhythm, a frequency that it vibrated on, but Lumina ignored it. Through it all, she kept her focus on the light. Even as the pulse expanded to every place in her body, she never let the sensation distract her. Lumina opened her eyes. White light poured out of her head and filled the room. Then it retreated and left Lumina tingling throughout her entire body. Her horn throbbed. What? She shouted at the darkness and the silent computers. Did I really just... Lumina couldn't finish the question. Yes, you did. First of Growing Season, 10,044 A.C. So, tell me about this Twilight Sparkle, Miss Specter. A mean unicorn by the name of Silver Prickle hunched over his clipboard and picked up a pen with his mouth. Lumina wasn't impressed or intimidated by his fancy office with the view or the degrees that backed his chair. The fact that he still didn't have her name right was all she needed to judge his character. That and he was gray, way too gray to be friendly, or to get invited to any pony's party. I told you my name is Lumina, she said. My father's Lightning Spectre, that's his name. No pony calls me that. My name isn't Miss Spectre or Lumina Spectre, it's just Lumina. Very well. Silver Prickle kept his eyes fixed on his clipboard and scribbled while he spoke. I like to refer to my patients by their surname, but if you insist, we can disregard such formalities. He finished writing and let the pen drop from his mouth. Now, please, tell me about the voices in your head. Do they tell you to do anything bad, such as hurt yourself or some other pony? In the shadow of his desk, she was nothing more than an ant beneath the Grand Arbiter's gavel. Yes, he could squish her, but before he reduced her to an oopsie on the underside of his mallet, he was going to listen to her and take her seriously. Lumina hopped off the couch and marched up to Silver Prickle's desk and looked him square in the eye. She's not like that! Lumina stomped her hooves. You're not listening to me. She's my friend. We're pony friends forever and she taught me how to do magic. I see. Silver jotted down some notes and gestured at the couch. Now, if you'd please take a seat, Lumina, we can continue. Fine. And so the next 2,000 hours between 3 and 4 o'clock passed. At the end of the session, Silver Prickle took Lumina's weight and made her say, ah, to study her tongue, and called in her father. Silver Prickle sat behind his big desk and motioned for Lumina and her father to take the seats opposite of him, and for no other reason than Silver Prickle offered, Lumina refused to sit down. Your daughter is the perfect physical health for a filly her age. Silver Pickle glanced at his charts and made an arch with his hooves. She is a healthy weight and height for her age group. However, her mental health is a whole other matter itself. I always suspected as much, said her father. Her mother never wanted to admit it, but I always thought she might suffer from a psychological illness. We prefer the term dysfunction, but yes, it was a good thing you brought her in, Mr. Specter. The earlier we diagnose these things, the better. Your daughter is unable to separate fantasy from reality, more specifically as she is suffering from what we call delusional startling syndrome. And you're certain of this after only a few sessions? Lumina's father shifted in his chair two or three times. I was under the impression that Sterling syndrome was rather rare and difficult to diagnose. It is rare, but not unheard of in young colts and fillies. I would usually prefer to gather more information before making such a diagnosis, but this is a textbook case. Lumina paced about until she wandered near her father. He ran a hoof through his daughter's mane and then turned his worried eyes to Silver Prickle. It doesn't have a genetic basis, does it? Her father asked. Not that we are aware of, Silver Prickle said. Why do you ask? Is there a history of mental dysfunction in your family? Uh, yes, I was diagnosed with the same dysfunction when I was her age. Lumina's father pulled her in a little closer, and she didn't resist. However, that's irrelevant if it isn't hereditary. What's going to happen to me? 
Lumina nestled in closer to her father for the security of his presence. Her father opened his mouth to speak, but it wasn't him that answered. Silver Prickle spoke out from behind his desk with smug authority and drove Lumina closer to her father. It means, Lumina, that with therapy you can live a perfectly normal life. He pushed a brochure across the table to Lumina's father. Medication is by no means a long-term solution, but there are prescriptions that help ease ponies suffering from this syndrome to adapt to new, healthier modes of thought. Lumina's father grabbed the brochure and flipped through it. What kind of therapy did you have in mind? asked Lumina's father. I'm afraid I don't know yet, and I'll need to examine your daughter further before I can formulate an effective treatment. In the meantime, I want to get your daughter started on Nulamine. Silver Prickle jotted on a pad of paper and passed it off to Lumina's father. I think that 20 milligrams once in the morning should be enough, but if she ever starts getting headaches, I want you to drop the dosage down to 10 right away. Some mild nausea should be expected. Thank you. Thank you so much for your help. Lumina's father stuffed the brochure and prescription into his saddlebags and hoisted them over his back. Forgive us for cutting this meeting a little short, but my daughter and I have another engagement we're already running late to. Before you go, are there any questions I can help answer? Yeah, what is this medicine going to do to me? Lumina spoke up at the pony behind his aircraft carrier of a desk. He leaned over and fired his gaze right down at Lumina. This medication, Lumina, is going to make the voices in your head stop. Once her father and Silver Prickle exchanged the obligatory hoofshakes and formalities, Lumina and her father hurried out of the office building and boarded a tram headed for the waterfront district. Lumina tried explaining to her dad how she liked Twilight and that she didn't want the voices to stop. He didn't want to entertain her delusional fantasies for another minute and certainly had no desire to discuss the subject in a crowd of strange ponies. Lumina pouted in her seat and gave her father her back. She didn't like the trams. They always smelled funny and made a lot of noise. Just beyond her window, the capital city of Planet Arion sprawled out, and for miles upon miles, all Lumina spotted were shining towers that reached up beyond the clouds. Earth ponies and unicorns settled this world, and as the product of two different cultures, the buildings there embody both nobility and practicality. They reminded Lumina of crystals, mystical and beautiful but also as hard and sturdy as stone. It gets better, her father said after a forever of silence. He looked across the seat at her and put a hoof on her shoulder. I know you might not believe it, but I know exactly what you're going through. Did you have ponies that talked to you too? Lumina let go of enough of her anger to ask the question. Yes, and some of them even told me how to cast spells, said her father. Or so I believed at the time. I listened to them and their advice, and you know where it got me? Standing in the middle of the street, in the middle of the night, completely by myself. I was in some sort of trance chasing after, I don't remember what. I guess it was a library. When I came to, I was terrified, and rightfully so. I didn't know where my parents were. I could have died that evening. I don't want that to ever happen to you. I'm not going to lie, the next few months might get a little difficult, but your mother and I will both be there and help you through whatever comes. She doesn't understand how dangerous this condition can get, but we are both willing to do whatever it takes to help you. Lumina opened her mouth to talk, but the tram rolled into the station and screeched to a halt. Without saying more, her father stood up and guided her out of the tram. The tram dropped them off at a park where the sea and city met. They waited on a park bench that overlooked the Sapphire Sea as Lumina watched the birds in a birch tree sing to their families. Technicolor flocks met in formation in the sky and weaved between high towers. Her father kept his eyes fixed on the data pad and didn't even register the birds or the summer breeze. Lumina, it says here that Nulamine is effective for treating foals like yourself. Lumina's father talked, but she didn't listen. I think this will work out very well for you. Mommy! Lumina pointed at a pink unicorn trotting towards their bench with a smile. She hopped off the park bench and galloped towards her mother and leapt up to hug her. I missed you so much, Mommy, said Lumina. I've missed you too, sweetie. She kissed her daughter on the forehead and let go of her as Lumina's father ambled up to them. Hello, Lightning. How did the session with Dr. Prickle go? It went well, he said. 
he diagnosed Lamina with delusional Sterling syndrome and prescribed some medication. Good news is that with the medication and therapy, she'll be better in no time. If you want, I can go get it filled and bring it by your apartment. No, that's fine. I'll take care of it. Lamina's mom waited for him to dig up the papers and hoof it over. He held it out for her to take. You'll promise to take care of this immediately and get her started on the medication first thing tomorrow morning? He pulled it away from Lamina's mother as soon as she was about to grab it and left her biting air. Lamina's mother frowned as if she were about to swirl around and kick him in the face. The little filly had never seen her mother this upset before, not even back when her parents still lived together and argued. She didn't like this. Just because I don't agree with how you want to raise our daughter doesn't mean that I would do anything to subvert her mental health. She snatched the papers from Lumina's father. The very idea that I would... Never mind. I'll take care of it. She looked down at her daughter. Do you have everything you need for the next couple of days? Lumina nodded. Okay, then say goodbye to your father and we'll get going. After giving her father a brief hug, Lumina and her mother hustled out of the park and boarded the tram to the city center. Lumina didn't really know what to say for a big chunk of the tram ride, and her mother was too busy pouting to start a conversation with her daughter. I'm sorry you had to see me like that, said her mother. It's just that your father, you have to understand, he only wants the best for you, and that's all that matters. Lumina looked out the window and watched the city roll by. Hey, let's do something really fun. Her mother nudged Lumina in the side. Like what? I don't know. How about we go to the aquarium? All right. Lumina's face lit up. She loved the aquarium. Let's get this prescription filled first and drop by the apartment. Then we'll go to the aquarium. Mommy? Yes, Lumina? You're the best mommy ever. And you're the best filly a mother could ever ask for. And don't forget it. Just as Lumina's mother promised, they got off the tram near the pharmacy and went inside to get her medicine. Lumina hated going to the pharmacy. It always took way too long to get the medicine, and the ponies behind the counter always told her parents to wait in a really stinky waiting area. The only thing fun to do in the store was to look at all the toys and holiday decorations in the aisles. That got boring quick. Mommy, can we go to the aquarium now? Lumina pleaded to the side of her mother's chair. It's really boring here, and it smells like stale candy. No, Lumina, we can't. Her mother flipped the virtual page of her magazine. We have to be patient and wait until the medicine is ready. Lamina plopped herself down in a chair beside her mother. Beside her was a window, and on the other side hung a little green bud from a branch on a leafy bush. It quivered, and Lamina gasped. Look, Mommy! Lamina tugged at her mother's mane. It's a cocoon like the ones I learned about in Miss Sunshine's class. I think it's about to hatch. That's nice, sweetie. But what did Mommy tell you about pulling on ponies' manes? She didn't even bother looking away from her magazine. So, Lumina ignored her and watched the butterfly emerge all by itself. It was still too early in the season for butterflies. She worried that it would freeze in the coming rains. As she watched that creature fight and push and break its way free from the cocoon, she set aside her worries. The butterfly struggled along on uncertain legs and unfurled its rainbow wings in the light of the sun. The butterfly was a fighter, a survivor, and it was not alone. <laughs>